My name is David Summerfleck. For over 20 years, I worked as a digital marketing agency project manager and consultant where I helped business owners go from failure and ruin to reinvesting profits. Now I'm interviewing other experts and professionals to find out what makes them tick and get their thoughts on how you can learn from their experiences and revitalize your life professionally and personally. We cover topics as wide ranging as digital marketing, business innovation, culture, global trends, and ways we can all better channel our creativity. So let's join the discussion. And thank you for tuning in for another episode of the podcast today. My guest is Jenny Wright. Jenny connects with entrepreneurs daily on marketing and enlist building online. She's also a speaker and trainer who can be found online reading and developing her skills and current trends and techniques that grow her client businesses. Uh, Since she founded management in 2011, And then her own brand in 2012, Uh, Jenny's been passionately mentoring clients and how to build their businesses and branding using creative marketing approaches and authentic social media and more. Jenny has over 15 years experience in communications, branding and marketing, having worked for Costco Wholesale and several Fortune 500 companies before leaving and working in her own company. Thank you for joining me for a few minutes, Jenny. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. I'm happy to be here. Well, thank you again. Uh, Let's start with your background. And if you can, can you basically explain how you came to be interested in list building and working uh, toward what ends or how how you put it to use? Oh, gosh. I fell into it completely by accident. When I left my corporate job, I didn't know what I was going to do. And I heard this, you know, the the new thing was being a virtual assistant. So I ended up on, you know, that website Fiverr. I was on Fiverr. I was actually getting, you know, gigs on Fiverr, which meant I was making $3.43 for each gig, which was ridiculous, considering I worked in a Fortune 500. Uh, But I knew I had to, you know, sort of set myself up there. What happened was is that somebody hired me to do research for experts for a summit. And I kept asking questions like, what is this for? And how does it work? And just asking all the questions. And it was incredibly interesting what they were doing. Online summits were still pretty fresh at the time and and really interesting to do. And it was like this big thing. So I really wanted to know more about it. And that was my first foray into list building, which was online summits Uh, within, I think that was in 2012, I believe. And by the end of 2012, I already had something like, you know, 18 clients that I was working with, I just powered ahead. I was just like, oh, I like this and figured it out. What I liked about list building was the attraction of the ideal client through, you know, very clear marketing methods that were authentic and, you know, weren't spammy and weird. And I just really liked how people could connect and you could attract these people to your business and then sell your programs, products and services. It just seemed like the perfect thing. Okay. What do you think are, what are the, the, the wrong and right ways that you've seen business owners go about building a list? I've, I've, I've probably done some of both. There's a, there is a lot. And some of the wrong ways are also the right ways for different people. And some of the right ways are wrong ways for other people. It really does. It really does depend on who you are and what you do. But universally, some of the wrong ways to do list building is in a a wide net blanket approach. Think fishing and just trying to like, you know, the seas of every single life form that's in them and then going, oh, I didn't want dolphins. Okay, I'm going to, you know, too bad those died. And I didn't want this, like the bycatch sort of thing. And when we do that, when we when we cast a wide net and we just like, I want everybody on my list because that means I can sell to everybody, that's mm-hmm. a complete misnomer. We can't sell to everybody and we shouldn't be trying to attract everybody. 
you should be incredibly niched and speak only to the people that actually need what you want. And you, what you want should be something like a sub sub niche. I'll give you an example. If you are a raw vegan food coach, so you help people with their, you know, their lifestyle of wanting to be vegan with raw food, as opposed to cooked vegan food, then you're not going to do a list build where it's like, Hey, improve your health with, you know, just improve your health with new dietary tips. And then you're getting people who want to eat keto. You want people who are, you know, interested in just full on meat eating people who want cooked food versus raw food. And the first time you go to email those people and say, Hey, I'm so-and-so and and I'm a raw vegan food coach. You're going to lose like three quarters of your list of new people because they didn't know what they were going to get. You weren't clear enough and they don't want what you have. So that's a really big one. That's like the biggest issue with a lot of list building. And when you're first starting out and you've never list built before, most people think cast a wide net and it's better for me. And it absolutely isn't. The best things that you can do with list building, the very, very best is do it often, do it continuously, do it with consistency, right? So having a really great lead magnet that your ideal client wants and then having more than one, right? So people learn in different ways. Some people like to watch videos, some people like checklists, some people like downloads, some people like on-demand trainings. There's a different way that everybody learns. Some people like podcasts. They just like to listen to the audio and that's how they learn. That's actually my preferred way of learning is podcasts. Now, if you have one lead magnet and it's a downloadable PDF checklist, you're not gonna get me to download it. I'm never gonna do it because it's just gonna sit on my desktop. Mm, Okay. So what I recommend for everybody is have multiple different lead magnets that service the different types of ways that people learn. And you're not going to, you're not going to start that way, right? So David, you're not going to have four lead magnets out of the gate, but start with one and then build another and then build another and build another so that you have, you're covering all these different aspects. Those are the two dichotomies of the ways to do it, the good ways and also the bad ways. Yeah, it would be incredible to meet a business owner who hasn't thrown something up online yet. And then you could work with them to create all of that before they actually launch. That would be amazing. That? That's that would be bit. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. But I also work with people and I see this a lot too with people who already have a lead magnet out, but it's not performing. Yeah. And there's a lot of opportunity to go in there and figure out why it's not performing and then fix those issues so that it does perform and then counsel them on the next thing they should be creating. When we talk about list building, what are the different types of lists and the different types of uses or applications for the lists and where does segmentation come in? Because I know you you kind of touched on that before where we want a particular type of referral or a certain type of subscriber prefer. I mean, obviously. So basically, I guess what I'm asking is what are the different types of lists and the different uses or case studies? How do we kind of break that down? I'm not sure if we have different types of lists per se. I think the goal is always to attract a list of your ideal potential customer or client. And then you can create those subcategories, that segmentation. And how that works is you might have people who've signed up to receive your newsletter. And every week you're gonna send them a newsletter and they're going to receive sort of like a a roundup, which is an email that says, hey, I did this, I was on this podcast, I did that, come check this out, I'm doing this live, next week I'm on this event, that's called a roundup. And some people really just like to get that information. When somebody comes into your list via a lead magnet, and we just talked about having several lead magnets, if somebody comes in through a checklist that is specifically on how to um, how to take really good selfies for social media. That's your, that's your checklist. Okay. And if people do that, then they're interested in selfies for social media. And if you're a social media manager, you might also have a lead magnet that says how to get high paying clients from clubhouse. 
I actually have a client who has that exact lead magnet. So what we'll do is we'll create segmentation because the person that wants the selfies, how to take selfies, like good selfies on social media, may not be interested in Clubhouse because Clubhouse is an audio form. Social media that they're talking about is taking pictures and selfies, completely different audiences. So you'll have segmentation so that the person who wants that checklist stays in a segment that's specifically for them. Now they may receive that newsletter that I told you about because that can be universal to your entire list, but they only want to receive information about increasing their social media, probably through things like Instagram, and you would send very like detailed information to them. The person who wants to get high paying clients out of Clubhouse is a completely different strategy. They also would get that newsletter that we discussed, but they would receive very targeted information and maybe a product, maybe you have a product, like a six week course or something that you could sell about getting clients from social media. So I like to have one or just two lists but I like to have many segments within that list so that I can keep parsing people into different categories and continue to you know, market to them appropriately based on their actions within my little sphere of influence. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And let me make sure that, I, that I'm on the right track with you. So let's say for the sake of example, I have a dentist because everybody knows what a dentist does and you know, what that overall experience is like and, you know, what they should be blogging about and, and so on. So, I mean, if you have a dentist and the dentist wants to have list building, which I don't see why they wouldn't. So the dentist could have offerings for this type of client, like let's say new clients. So the dentist would have blog posts in videos and giveaways and what have you for new clients and then maybe another category of blog posts and courses and giveaways for already established patients who've already been there for a while and are already comfortable with them and to keep them coming back over and over again is and so they'd have two different types of offerings and basically two separate lists. Is that fair? It is. And let's take it, let's take that example to the next level. So let's just say that when you are a new client of this dentist and you fill out that form, you indicate that you have kids and, you know, have, because it might say that you have a couple kids. Well, then that would be a great way to create some targeted email blasts to the people who have identified that they have children and say, hey, when was the last time you brought your kiddo in for a cleaning? We're doing a special for kids. And if you bring them in between now and December 31st, not only will they get their cleaning at a special price, 20% off, but we'll also make sure they get a plush toy or you know, something, 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 right? So now you're creating that deeper segmentation and really going for that information. So that would be great for somebody like a dentist. And I'm on my dentist's email list and I get, you know, emails about specials and, and things like that. They actually even text message me, which is a, another form of list building. And they text message me and be like, hey, we've got a special going on for teeth cleaning. So when I filled out my form as a brand new client of theirs, it said, what potential areas are you interested in for your overall dental blah, blah, blah. And I said, teeth whitening, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I like, I actually parsed myself into different categories mm -hmm. and now I'm getting emails and indicate and, and text messages about those things. So how we bring people into our list is just as important as how we market to them and creating that deeper segmentation and having people quote unquote self identify for us helps us make that happen. And that can just be like an extra question on an opt-in form or having somebody take a little two second survey, like a three question survey, or, you know, having you know, like, Hey, thanks for registering for X, Y, Z. Are you interested in ABC? Cause if you are, I have that too. And doing like a one click segmentation within your list so that, you know, you do that. The other ways that, and this is a great way too, is having a coming soon page for a product or for a service that you're going to be doing and saying, do you want me to let you know when this thing actually starts to go live? Cause, or do you want to know when the new grocer is about to open? It's it's, we're building it right now, but it's not going to open until October Enter your name and email on this site and have like a QR code right on the door, right? Scan the QR code, 
takes your information. Now you're on the mailing list for this new custom grocer and you'll get an email when it opens, right? That, that's the kind of list building that people in small businesses need to look at doing and getting very savvy. Yeah, I agree with you. Let me ask you about when you were with list building or basically having lists, I think you said a cutoff would be maybe two or three. Is that right? You really yeah, don't? I, I don't like to have a bunch of lists. I'll explain why. It gets really hard to manage yeah. in your email marketing software when you have a bunch of different lists. The problem being is the lists, I mean, you can have 70 lists, 80 lists, 100 lists if you want, but maybe maybe david you're interested in fly fishing and you're interesting in you're interested in deep sea fishing let's just say this as a new example and if you're on the fly fishing list but you're also on the deep sea fishing list and you know by chance you ended up on a different fishing list that this guy's got then you're getting um you're going to be bombarded by information that you may or may not want right sometimes inside these email marketing systems if you're on more than one list, then you start getting repetitive emails and it becomes like a thing where you get too many emails and then you become disinterested and you actually right. leave, right? So for somebody like me who plays in the building of these things, my recommendation is always to create tagging and segmentation versus having 60,000 different lists uh, because it's really it gets really difficult on my side, the person who does a lot of the implementing, to play in there. Uh, and that's just a personal preference, I guess. And I mean, you know what? People can people can have a different view and a different opinion than me. Um, we can, you know, talk about it. But yeah, that's just my that's just my feeling. Yeah, I could easily see how that would be a real pain to work with on a daily basis. Let me ask you, while we're kind of on the topic of too much and when, where to where to draw the line with certain things, when we talk about giveaways, I from my own perspective, I've been in digital marketing since the web began. So I have this mammoth backlog of ebooks, videos, courses, infographics like you wouldn't believe, sure. um, hundreds of blog posts. I'm still in the process of trying to figure out what to give away, what to post, what to charge for. Mm -hmm. What do you see? as the most important function of the giveaway, the item that we give away for free. And then to take that a step further, like what do you know, how do you know that this is something that your ideal niche client wants as, you know, as opposed to, hey, this is something I should charge for because this is really too good to give away for free. Those are three very good questions. And I'm going to be able to answer it probably with one pretty concise answer. Okay. The answer is basically to that entire question is you need to know your market. You need to know your ideal client and you need to do proof of concept. So you can do this really easily with social media. You could post on social media saying, Hey, I've been going through my, like my info vault all of the stuff that I've worked on over the years, I've got courses and downloads and this and that and infographics at the wazoo, but I want to know what you would, what you guys want and what would be helpful. What do you think? Would you want a checklist on ABC or XYZ? Would an infographic make sense for you or would a mini course make sense? And would you pay for a mini course? Like asking some questions and getting people to respond is actually taking the whole, I don't know what's going to work factor out of it. And then partially, you know, there's, there's two different fields or two different points of view. Some people think like, oh my God, no, I'm not going to give that little mini course away because I worked so hard on it and it's such high value and I should be, you know, people should be paying for that. But do you actually know that they would pay for it? So this is where you could get on some calls with people and say, hey, or get on social media even and say, hey, I'm looking for four beta testers people who will go through this little course and tell me if it's, you know, tell me what you think. Have people go through it. They have to give a review or a testimonial and then ask one of the questions that you would have almost like an exit survey for them would be, what would you pay for this? Do you think this is valuable enough that you would pay for it? Or if this was given to you for free as an entry and then you were 
you know, push towards a higher level program, product, or service, would that make sense? So there has to be some investigative work that happens to really understand what you need to do. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I think, um, I think some of that decision really involves the, how you feel about what you're offering to some extent anyway. Um, as an example, I was just digging through my PC. I mean, literally just digging through all these files. I found a four hour video boot camp that I had done. Maybe, I don't know if it was 10 years ago, maybe give or take a few years. So it was a WordPress training boot camp for nonprofit administrators that I had done. And someone had videotaped it. And the video quality is about 50-50. There are parts of it. And I thought the quality of this is very good. It's a four-hour boot camp that's very, very good. We charged a good deal for people to attend this. But they also got a download. They always got the copy of the PowerPoint and notes and so on. But as a video, there are times in that video where you can't really hear everything being said and you can't see what's actually up on the screen. So I thought, I really don't feel good about charging for that because of those reasons. So let me offer it for free and then get input. Now, over time, if I do a rebooted version of that and then include the footnotes and then include the free consultation, yeah, I would charge. I wouldn't give that away, especially at that incredible length of time. You I know, wouldn't for, even give it away now because it's 10 years old. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly of the year, but um, I do honestly feel that a lot of the content is still good because even though WordPress has changed, a lot of the plugins are still being used. The bulk of the visual editor, the bulk of the editors, for all intents and purposes, very, very similar. And where I agree with you on that, my marketing slash coaching brain will come into play and say, sadly, absolutely not. Like I wouldn't even give it away for free because it is, it has a perceived, because of how it looks, like you look younger, right? You're, you know, whatever, five to 10 years younger. That curly uh, hair. Right. And all of that, they're going to perceive that that is out of date information, even though it's not, they're going to perceive that it is based on just how it looks. I, th I mean, I think it's a valid point. And also it could be more slick. It could be more branded. Uh, yep, I would just and, redo it. Yeah. And also I'm a different person than I was that long ago. I've learned a lot more. I do work differently now. And I, and to, to address that point too, I still have the, uh, the core materials. So I'm in the process of doing just that. Let me ask you about landing pages and funnels. Most business owners and entrepreneurs seem to get those two mixed up. Can you basically explain for the lay person out there listening how the two differ from actual websites and when and where they should be used under what circumstances? Sure. That's a good question. So a landing page is usually a standalone page and it can be part of a funnel. Okay. But I'll explain the funnel in a second. So a landing page is somewhere where you go to enter your name and email and receive something in return. It could be a download, a PDF, registering for a webinar, something along those lines. The goal is to get the person to take action and to put in their email address so that the person who's created the landing page gets that. So that's a landing page. <clears throat> landing pages, their whole goal is to get people to take an action. That's it. A funnel is a process where we have multiple pages with multiple points of action, with the goal being that people take different actions within the funnel and slowly yet surely self-identify what they're interested in and or possibly take advantage of offers within a funnel. I'll give you an example. So let's just say there's an on-demand training. Mm -hmm. The on-demand training requires a landing page. Enter your name and email and you'll immediately get access to this 60 minute training about how to grow microgreens all on your own, in your own, in your very own kitchen. Great. Perfect. I get my, my on-demand training about 
you know, 30 minutes into that on-demand training on the page where I'm watching it, a little pop-up pops up and says, hey, did you want to take advantage of this bundle that's going to help you grow microgreens in your kitchen? It has everything you need. It's a complete bundle and it's only $40 plus shipping. Click here to do that now. So now we're getting people to self-identify by clicking on that link or not clicking on that link and going to this bundle offer for a low price. $40 plus shipping is like a pretty low price, right? So either you take it or you don't. If you don't take it, now you've self-identified as somebody who didn't want to buy that product, but maybe want to buy something in the future, you never know. The people who bought it are most likely to buy something else. They go further down the funnel and now it's like, hey, before we, you know, before we send you your brand new grow your microgreens in your kitchen kit, if you want to get the grow light that's going to make this work really well, just click this box and you can add that grow light for $199. The grow light's going to last 15 years. It has the full spectrum of, of lighting and it's going to do exactly what you want and help your microgreens grow three times faster, right? So that's a funnel. That's how we get people to join something for free, check out a low priced offer or self-identify that they don't want it, get them to take the next offer on the next opportunity and so on and so forth. When can we use them and where should we use them? They can be used depending on what you do in so many different applications. And it doesn't matter how big or small your business is. They can be used pretty much everywhere. I, I went through a funnel the other day through um, a clothing brand. I wanted one thing from them. I wanted to get a sports bra from this clothing brand. And when I went to go and buy the sports bra, I got a pop-up saying, hey, I know you want the sports bra. We've got the matching leggings that go with it. And all you have to do is click here and you'll get it for 20% off. I was like, that's some good marketing. Because now it was like matchy matchy. The difference between that and a website. So the funnel, we now understand it's get them to take an action, self-identify, purchase something and move along the line. Whereas a website is basically the, the hanging of your shingle online. It's putting up your storefront and saying, this is what I do. This is who I am. This is how I help people. And although we can use your website as an entry point to your funnels, I, albeit your landing page for your on-demand webinar training on how to grow microgreens in your kitchen, but also different things like, you know, a checklist, et cetera. So it can be an entry point into those funnels. The purpose of a website is informational and also potentially transactional if you have like a shop on it. But the majority of the information on there is informational. That's why it has a blog. That's why it has an about me page, a home page, a work with me page, a testimonial page, a media page. So that's the repository for the information, all like all associated for your business. Whereas funnels, the goal is to get you to take a distinct and clear action. Does that help? It helps. And I love it because you, you sound like about 10 different blog posts I've written. So I, I love it. I'm in total agreement with you. Let me ask you to take a step back and I want to see when I talk to new business owners and, and small business owners who want to really get traction with digital marketing. It, the one of the things I always hear is what do we write about? We don't know what to write about. Nobody here can write. Um, and in some cases, what they do is highly specialized, you know, like the dentist or the lawyer or the doctor. Um, I don't feel qualified to write the content for them. I don't have any medical background, obviously. Um, I wouldn't know where to begin, except in very, very broad, you know, sweeping terms, you know, why a dentist is good for you or why to go see this doctor or what, what have you. So how would you, and this may be too broad, how would you go about helping them define their unique selling proposition, which is, you know, an archaic marketing term, you know? to define what, what brought them to the dance, so to speak. Uh, I believe the first part of that question was how to figure out what content they would write. Yeah. Okay. That part's actually very easy. I've actually written for, I've, I've written content for uh, a doctor, a lawyer and a dentist. So I can actually answer this one quite well. Okay. 
the the thing that you're going to write about isn't necessarily the uh, the medical journal style of writing. I'm not qualified for that. And honestly, the layperson's never going to read it. Prior to prior to COVID, uh, I you know I don't think a lot of people had read any medical journals. I know a lot of people who've been reading them since COVID because they want to stay on top of information. But prior to that, most you know there's those were those were specifically for researchers and other people in the same sort of field. If a doctor, lawyer, or dentist is trying to create that value prop for their potential ideal client, they need to speak like their ideal client and they need to address the problems of that ideal client at the level at which those people think and speak. Mm, okay, so okay. let me make sure I'm, I'm getting what you're saying. So if I were to write content for a dentist, I wouldn't need the dentist or a dental um, practitioner nope. or whatever to write it. What I would do is just write something, hey, here is what you should know about cavities. And Actually, I would, yeah, I would, change, I would make it fun. Four things, you, four ways you can prevent cavities and still eat the sugar you want. Right, and then, and, and, yeah, and, um, uh, you know, the import, you know, what to expect before getting a root canal or, you know, or root canals for, 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 for afternoon fun or something. I don't know, but some, but something like that, I get which, where you're going. So you would paint with a broad brush and it wouldn't be anything that you could not research and learn okay. elsewhere like WebMD or, and the same is true for a lawyer, what you should know. Uh, five uh, tips before considering uh, divorce. Sure, and that's easily available information, absolutely. Now with a lawyer, obviously, there's a little bit more to be concerned with and you wanna make sure that there's like a a disclaimer, right. you know, that kind of thing. But any any good ghostwriter could write that content for those people, right. no problem whatsoever. And I've, I've literally written for all of them. Yeah, I have one or two clients in particular who are just the sweetest people on the planet. Love them to death. Been with me for 10 years or more. And I would, I've would i been trying to get them to write more content. I don't have the time to do it. And um, getting them... The easiest way to get people to write content is to give them content prompts. Yeah. Right? So if you... if you Prompts. Use... That's important to, to say P-R-O-M-P-T-S. Yes, prompts. Yeah. yeah, like we used to do in school um, to try to encourage them. Yes. Yeah. So if you can give people if you can give people a content prompt, then it makes it easier for them to write. And if you can give people even almost like a template about how to write a really good blog post, you know, introduction, pain points, et cetera, et cetera, and you can give them almost like a bulletized sort of structure, and they just have to fill in the blanks and add some, you know, inf information in there. And it's a heck of a lot easier than looking at a blank page. So when you're trying to encourage people who don't like mm. to write content or feel hampered by doing it in some way, shape or form, then you have to overcome that. The other way that you can get people to overcome it, and this is a wonderful way that people can use to create content if they're struggling, open up your phone and dictate into your phone. Just dictate content into your phone. Anybody, if I went up to any lawyer, doctor, or dentist and said, what are the four things I should consider before I do X and just tape them, they'd have no problem rattling it off. If I asked them to write it, that's where the struggle comes in. So if you tape yourself talking about the thing and then you get that transcribed and then all you have to do is tidy up that transcription, then you've got blog posts. I think that's a fantastic idea. I can't claim that idea as my own. I actually got it from my co-host on my uh, podcast, Allison Lex. It's one of the methods she uses, but I've used it ever since she told me, and it's phenomenal. Yeah, one of the things I used to do was to use my phone actually to record uh, client conversations at some point, or if we're reviewing a um, a contract, I would record that. So now you have it in writing. You also have the, co the client saying, I understand these points. I agree. I don't have an issue with it, you know, mm -hmm. um, which is different, but somewhat related on, as far as recording. I think those are fantastic ideas. Let me ask you as far as 
when you're writing content, you hear a lot about narrative flow, authenticity, trying to marry that with your content marketing. Do you have an approach that you would use or maybe recommend for helping those in marketing and maybe for the business owner as well on the flip side to try to kind of unify that process so you've got the authenticity that who and what you write about what you create is you but you do it in a narrative type of way and then can use that for your content marketing other than what we already discussed that is by sheer at least for me my opinion is that it is by absolute sheer consistency so it is it is committing to creating content on a regular basis, knowing that it is not going to be Pulitzer Prize winning stuff at all, but with practice, it will improve over time. Yeah. If you wait until you think you can write perfectly, you're never going to write. You're never going to create any content. So my first social media posts are absolutely atrocious. They're terrible. You know, They're horrible. It's an interesting synchronicity that you say that because I was actually... I printed up an article just for myself because I have a degree in English with an emphasis in creative writing and I always have difficulty writing. And I saw this article and I don't think anybody can read it backwards. Perfectionist tendencies are associated with reduced cognitive flexibility and heightened emotional suppression. This is from a website called SciPost.org to speak to this perfectionist approach where you want everything to be 100% right. So I think in, in so many cases, it's, it's really vitally important to get it out there first and foremost. Then you can add the links, then you can add the back links and the internal links, then you can work on improving the SEO. Do you agree with that? I do, I do agree with it. I think people just need to get in the process. If you're going to wait for perfectionism, you're never going to get anything done. Yeah. That's, that applies to your website. That applies to everything. I mean, my website is not perfect by any means. And I honestly, I don't care. It's there. I'm working on it. It'll improve. But I'm not going to wait and be a perfectionist and work on my website for three years and make sure that everything is perfect or I'm never going to get it out there. And by not having it out there, I would miss a boatload of opportunities and I'm just not playing that game. Yeah. And you can't refer people to something that isn't there. You know, uh, let me ask you about virtual summits. Can you basically talk about, you know, what they are, what purposes they serve, how to get started with them and, and you know, maybe how to properly use them for business owners? Sure. That would actually be almost an entire podcast on its own. Uh, I'll try and summarize this pretty good if I can. Okay. Online, so online summits are an online event. Uh, they're virtual. Their whole purpose is to grow the host's list. And we do this by interviewing experts. It's an interview-based online event. The experts do pre-recorded and sometimes some live or a hybrid thereof of interviews and then how the host grows their list is by saying hey you guys on september 23rd i'm launching this online event you get to see me and 25 of my awesome friends talk about this topic in particular and then the experts help promote the event to their followings by doing so the host then starts to grow an email list that the experts had on their list so if i can explain it a bit better because i don't feel like i'm explaining it perfectly Experts have, you know, the experts that are on the event have to promote. They have their own followings and email lists. By promoting, they're getting people to go to the landing page. When people go to the landing page and sign up, they're now part on the, now they're on the host's list, okay? The reason that we can do summits and, and the best way to do summits is you can launch a business with a summit. You can use a summit to grow your list before a launch. You can pivot and use a summit as a pivot point in your business if you're trying something different and new or a new topic. Summits up-level your entire business. They up-level your video skills, your writing skills, your communication skills, your joint venture skills, your relationship skills, your delegation skills, your leadership skills, your promotional skills. It just, it, all over the board, right across all of it, it increases your ability to do everything. And you will look at your calendar and you will look at yourself after a summit and go, I can't even believe I did all that. 
And then from there on out, your capacity to do more has increased by like, I don't know, several, several folds, right? I'm not going to say tenfold, but it's what you were doing before and what you were able to carry and do in your business, you'll be able to do more afterwards. Getting started with a summit is actually not that hard. It starts with researching potential experts and knowing a topic that you want to talk about. The topic should be something that your ideal client would be interested in. And you should know pretty clearly what you want to offer after a summit. So again, we're going to use the example of a raw, a raw vegan food coach. If you want to have us, if you want to get clients into your coaching program for raw vegan, co raw, ve bleh, raw vegan food coaching, and you want to get clients into that program, then you're not going to host a summit on, you know, uh, discover how, you know, the, um, the ultimate weight loss summit, discover how to, you know, discover how to lose weight through eating great. Okay. Cause that doesn't say that it's raw vegan food. So you're going to get everybody again, you're going to get the vegetarians, the keto, the Atkins, the, all of it, you're going to get everybody on there. And then when you pitch your program, product or service, they're not going to want it again, cause you were too wide. So summits need to be incredibly niched in, right? So how to live a happier, healthier life through a raw vegan lifestyle. That's going to be a summit that's going to attract your absolute ideal client. 100%. Nobody on there is going to be somebody that isn't going to be interested in potentially having a lifestyle in that way. So that's how, I, that's how you can get into it. How to make it actually happen is yeah, start in, you know, start looking at your topic, knowing what you want to offer, offer afterwards, look at potential experts, and now you've got to build it. This is where you could get support. You can get support from somebody like me who has produced over 300 summits. There's lots of people out there who talk about summits and do stuff. But what I will say is plan for 120 days of planning. Don't do 90 days. Uh, a lot of people say you need 90 days to plan these things, but honestly, you need 120 unless you want it to take over your life. And just do it piece by piece. The biggest piece is finding and getting experts on board. Everything else can be figured out later but just finding the right experts. Now, if you are a business owner or service provider and you want to be a guest on a virtual summit, what do you recommend is like the best way to find the right summit for you to be a speaker um, in or with? A lot of people post about online speaking opportunities and Facebook groups. So look for Facebook groups that say, find a guest, be a guest, online event, summit host groups, et cetera, et cetera. Join those and then take a look at what the posts are. Again, you have to do your own research and due diligence to make sure that the, the summit is a fit, that it's the right thing. Just like if you're trying to get on a podcast, you wanna make sure the podcast is the right fit, that your ideal client listens to these things, or it's not worth your time and effort. So you have to do the research. You have to be very proactive and make sure that you're doing the right thing. And that is by simply looking and asking questions. Okay. Let me ask for your thoughts. And I'm almost done. I have about three or four more to, to uh, ask you. I wanted to also get your take on being an author. Not everybody is cracked up to be an author. Not everybody wants to do it. I know a lot of people dread uh, writing. They just don't mm -hmm. enjoy it. So what are the pros for writing a book as a business owner or entrepreneur? And are there any cons? And if I should say, what are they? Good question. So writing a book is a great credibility piece. It's the opportunity to show yourself as an expert in your niche. It's still, even, even now in our day and age, it still um, has a bit of gravitas to it, adds a little bit of more weight to it. If you say that you're a published author, you usually can get better speaking gigs and better opportunities for some of those things than somebody who may not be. You just, it just adds a little bit more. It's that little panache. Now, having a book and being able to market that book isn't a completely separate thing, but I will say this, just by having a book doesn't mean you're going to make money with that book. So if you're going to write a book about business, don't expect that it's going to be a number one bestseller and you're going to make oodles and oodles of money. It usually doesn't work that way. Now I work with a lot of authors. I work with agents and I also work with publishers and publishers want authors to have a following. 
publishers back in the day used to do all of your, you know, they'd publish the book, they would do your media tour for you, they would, you know, promote the book for you and all these kinds of things. They don't do that anymore. Yeah. So publishers are looking for authors who have good followings and good community. One of the things I do with people is I actually help them grow their followings and community so they can sell more books, but that's an aside. So yes, a book is great. It adds authority and perspective and you know you're you're an expert in your in your in your niche the downside of writing a book is the time that could be involved in it if that's an issue for some people some people can write and have no problem but for other people it would be the time involved and then the only downside that i can see for most people who would write it is then not using it to the best of their ability i had a client who i was working with for uh you know a specific amount of time and it took them three weeks before they told me that they had written six books mm. and it's not on their website. They're not on Amazon. They're nowhere. They wrote six books and they're sitting, you know, they got a couple extra copies sitting in their garage. They're nowhere. And, you know, looking at how we could leverage that. So if you're going to write a book, be in it for the long haul of being able to say, I wrote a book, I'm an expert and being able to talk about that and getting that and using that as the leverage piece that it actually is. Okay. Um, let me just ask you about content repurposing is for me, content repurposing is basically what you were talking or alluding to earlier that some people digest their content in different formats, whether it's audio or video, um, it could be infographic, it could be written blog post. How do you define content repurposing and where do you kind of suggest that the business owner today breaks down content repurposing? Should they be thinking about that before they create the content or after? Content repurposing, yes, it, it is exactly what you said it is. It can be the audio, the visual and things like that. I look at content repurposing like this. If I write a blog, or a short, you know, a short blog or a medium sized blog. And I want to repurpose this content. I'll put it on my website. I'll post a good chunk of it on LinkedIn and say, read more here and go to my website. I will tweet about it on Twitter with a, you know, just a quick thing like, Hey, new blog is up, go check it out, head on over to the blog. I will actually, uh, you know, if I want to repurpose it into something that's very useful for people who like the audio version of it, I will, do an audio of it and then make an audiogram. If I want to repurpose it, I will take clips out of it, like little written clips, like little quotes, make those into graphics for social media. And that'll be my social media content for that week. So that's the repurposing that I would do. So you're taking one piece of content and finding multitudes of ways of actually using it. And we do this with, you know, we can do this with a podcast by getting a podcast. And this is what I do with mine is getting my podcast that I do with my friend. We get it transcribed. We pull pullouts out of that transcription. Those are our social media posts. The mm -hmm. transcription goes on the website. We make audiograms. We post, you know, blog like part of the transcription or the blog post on LinkedIn, and it just it goes everywhere. And all roads lead to listen to the podcast. Yeah, and which is kind of like the whole um, purpose of the landing page or the funnel to basically direct them to one focal point. Let me ask you in closing, if you have anything that you'd like to add to kind of pull everything together, or if you have any closing thoughts. I think the closing thought, because honestly, we covered so many different topics today that the biggest thing is consistency. If you're going to do something, the start and stop method is not going to serve you. So if you're going to list build, list build with consistency. If you're going to create content, create content with consistency. Again, if you start it and then you stop it after two weeks because you don't see anything happening, then you're never going to get anywhere. And then if you start it again two months from now and then you stop it again after a week because you're not getting anywhere, you're absolutely not going to get anywhere. So you have to commit to the long haul of actually doing something for a longer period of time. So if you're going to list build, you're going to list build for basically you're going to list build for the rest of your business time. I'm just going to be honest. But if you're going to create a podcast and people do this, don't quit after seven episodes. That's actually the funny enough. Yeah. That is the statistically most people who launch a podcast quit after seven episodes because they're not seeing any traction. I am over 150 episodes into my podcast. 
and I got traction probably around the 40th episode. You're very, so, very, you're so right with that. Cause I, I had two other podcasts before this one and I needed a break, took a break from one, went back like six months later and I was just shocked to look at the, uh, the statistics for it. Like mm -hmm. a, a thousand downloads or something. I couldn't believe it. You know, and consistency is what's going to make it happen. And the great thing about podcasting is that it just, li you know, it lives forever. So my, my parting, my parting thought is always going to be the consistency piece, because if you do anything ad hoc, if you do anything, just start stop method, you're never going to get anywhere. So commit to the longer vision of it. Look at the, you know, the big picture versus the macro on this. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. If uh, anyone watching or listening would like to get in touch with you, how can they do so? You can go to my very imperfect website at jennywright.com. You can also check out the podcast that I do at systemtothrive.com. And uh, earlier on, I actually mentioned there was, when we were talking about content prompts to write, I actually have a content prompt generator on the System to Thrive website that people can grab if they've got problems with writing their content so they can do that. But find me anywhere online. Again, my imperfect website at jennywright.com and also on social media. Uh, it's just Jenny Wright. That sounds great. Well, Jenny Wright, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you. This is great. It. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to the David Summerfleck podcast. If you would like to apply to be a guest on the podcast or would like to ask a question we may use in a future episode, please go to www.dms.blue slash podcast guest. Thanks again for tuning in and hope to meet you in the next episode.